welcome to this talk. And today we're going to be talking about Hermes, which is the Container Solutions Strategic Execution Toolkit, which is quite a long uh, sentence. Does anybody know who Hermes was? He was the god, uh, uh, he was a bit of a trickster, the god of both travelers and roads, and he spent his time living between uh, the world of man and the world of gods. Importantly, he was the patron of boundaries and the transgression of boundaries. Uh, and the reason we picked the codename Hermes for our strategic execution model is because Strategic execution is essentially about following guardrails, following the path that you are put on. But actually, innovation and successful strategy is knowing when to come off the path and when to come back on. So it's a paradox. And since Hermes was a trickster and the patron of boundaries, that was the name that we chose. So what is a toolkit? What is a strategic toolkit? It's nothing remarkable. Uh, it's a collection of processes, uh, procedures, in our case, meetings, it's a mindset, it's a set of characteristics that you keep in your team and that you cultivate. It's also a skill set. We're going to be getting into all of that today. The three things I'm going to go deep into, uh, what is strategic execution? We've been talking about this for millennia, right? People have been trying to figure this out. In the world of tech, every few years, I think it's worth remembering what is strategy and how do you execute it? Most of us are very busy doing what we're doing. Occasionally, it's wise to stop and think about that. I want to talk about continuous formulation. So continuous strategic formulation is essential in dynamic environments and contexts. If we don't understand that, it's very difficult to succeed with strategy in technology. And finally, I want to talk about the mechanics of execution. These are the things we use at Container Solutions. They're also the things we use with our customers when they're migrating to the cloud. <laughs> um, and we're hoping you can take some of those ideas away. If they work in your context, you can steal them wholesale. If they don't work, you can maybe be inspired by them and use them to bring your own strategies to life. So, what is strategic execution? Well, strategy is the thing that modulates the infinite imagination with finite resources. Uh, money, people, but mainly time, the most finite of resources. Um, so we can think of strategy as being this circle on the left-hand side of the screen. It's an idea, it's a concept. If you manage to pull it off, you might win a market, um, open a new office, uh, build a new product. Strategic execution is the thing that smashes strategy into a series of objectives. It's very common in technology, or it's very common for managers and leaders who are highly rational, very good at changing strategy into objectives, to, to not do this in the face of large-scale technical change. For some reason, otherwise rational people become very irrational and they don't do this. The reason we need to break objectives, or strategy, excuse me, into objectives is because we want to organize them. You want to put them in order. Sometimes one thing goes before another. So earlier on at the booth, somebody came to speak to me about setting up a cluster and onboarding some of their Java teams and their Node teams. The cluster should be finished before you start onboarding teams. Now that sounds logical, but you'd be surprised how often companies and teams do things out of order. And you need to be able to organize your objectives because you have to delegate them through your own organization. And that includes your extended organization, your partner network, your supplier network. For example, we're going to be doing some work in Switzerland in 2019. We have some objectives we need to meet now and we need to meet next year. We've broken this strategy up into pieces so we can start to delegate within, uh, to our teams in Switzerland and our providers and our different partners. Once you've delegated and started to execute, you start to learn. So it's at the boundary of execution where the fantasy world meets the real world that your organization starts to learn. So you might think, you might analyze yourself or one of your customers, and you think that power is trapped in one part of the organization, 
or uh, that there's a learning difficulty, what that might be are symptoms of a broken strategic execution method. So this is what we're trying to do. Break up your strategy into objectives, delegate power, and then start to learn. Clearly, this is an iterative process. Nothing goes in a straight line. Life certainly doesn't go in a straight line. When we start to think about the iterative nature of strategic formulation, we can start to think about continuous formulation. The three things we need to look at in this section are terms, breaks, and something to do with those words. Um, this is one of the most important things in our strategic execution model. It's our annual cycle. A lot of our customers adopt this cycle too. The two key components, and this is where we vary extremely differently to other strategic execution models. Is anybody using Intel's OKRs, objectives and key results? Okay. That's good to hear. Uh, Objectives and key results often don't have a break between one moment of strategic execution and the next. So the innovation that we bring to the table are these breaks in Easter, in summer, and then in winter. So the two key moments are the term, it's the execution term, and the breaks. The long term is a little bit of a play on words because it's when we do a little bit of long term thinking, but it's also literally the long term. It runs from September to the middle of December. Around about mid-October, we start to pull together all the insights of this year. What did we learn? What does it mean? And we try to figure out what just happened so that we can try to predict what might happen in the new year. And this is where we win as a business, and this is where our customers win with their cloud migrations. Or at least it's where they try to win, to begin the winning process. What happens in that strategic formulation that period between October and the end of the year, that's where we start to build up what we call the intended strategy. What is it that we intend to do uh, in the following year? Once the first term starts to execute, those ideas and those pieces of the strategy, which are really nothing more than hypotheses, start to make contact with reality. The parts of your strategy, the hypotheses, that don't survive contact with reality, they're discarded as non-realized strategies. The parts of the um, strategy, your hypotheses about what might happen that survive contact with reality continue to live in the deliberate strategy. The model is from a guy called Henry Minsberg, and he spoke about non-realized strategies. But we started to think of non-realized strategies as non-realized yet. So the concept of the fuck it bucket um, this is where we chuck ideas that don't work. Just chuck it in the fuck it bucket, right? It's, it's not actually a joke. It's a real thing at Container Solutions. Strategy has always got risk built into it, right? The way to take risks, or if you're going to take risks, you need courage. The bigger the risks, the larger the opportunity you're chasing. If you want to move to the cloud in 12 months, this is pretty risky. It's going to be expensive. Your career might be on the line. So our customers need a way to tackle this risk and be courageous at the same time. The fuck it bucket is one way we habitualized courage at Container Solutions. So we talk about trying things and chucking it in the bucket if it doesn't work out. However, what we also found very quickly is we're often back in the bucket picking out old bits of source code, pieces of projects, markets that were not ready last year, but are ready now. And so we started to see the contents of the bucket as really a type of uh, a series of components or a series of lessons learned that if we mine them for, for knowledge and for wisdom, we might actually be able to reuse them. So as the year unfolds uh, and the terms of execution come to an end and we have breaks, we start to see that emerging strategies come into the work streams. These are things that we didn't think of when we formed our intended strategy, but that, that are starting to make sense as the year progresses. If you look on our website, there's a, a case study from a bank, Starling Bank in the UK, and they moved to the cloud a couple of years ago. 
they said if they were going to make the move now, they would probably have used Kubernetes. So it just shows you how fast moving things are in our space and that the decisions that do seem logical, for example, in January, might make a lot less sense in September. Or put a different way, there might be alternatives, uh, uh, alternative implementations, things that are easier to do. So the terms and breaks give us a chance to jettison parts of the intended strategy that are not working. At the same time, they let us integrate these emergent strategies into our work streams. And this is the magic trick of this strategic execution model. It balances focus, productivity, and learning. However, if the process, which I've just shown you, and is actually quite common knowledge, and if the cadence and the execution and breaks uh, were all you needed to bring strategy to life, then out there in the world, everybody would be su succeeding with the strategic projects. Success with strategic change is the exception. It's not the norm. Most new strategies fail. What we've seen at Container Solutions, but also with our customers who are succeeding with continuous formulation, are four key characteristics. The first one is openness. The second one is judgment. The third one is creativity, and the fourth one is flexibility. Openness comes in two flavors. The first bit is that you have to be open to the concept that you might actually have been wrong, right? That's why the fuck it bucket is so powerful, right? You need mechanisms to admit that you were wrong. So you have to be open to this idea that your intended strategy or pieces of it was wrong, and you've got to throw it away. And at the same time, you have to be open to the fact that new ideas happen all the time, and some of them might be good enough to integrate into your strategy. Knowing which stratagems or small new pieces can be integrated requires judgment. Um, so just because ideas pop up all the time, it doesn't mean that they're timely. At the same time, some of your ideas that failed their contact with reality, if you hold on just a little bit, might prove to be correct. So knowing when to cut and run, or knowing when to double down, is an essential skill. The reason the breaks are so important at Container Solutions is because we're always developing hindsight in order to develop our foresight. This is how judgment is developed and how judgment is trained. Creativity. Um, you have to be creative to spot new ideas, right? New ideas enter into the stream uh, is the realm of creativity, newness. At the same time, rejuggling your plans and your strategies also require a type of creativity. We don't always think of planning as a creative act, but if you're going to do a continuous strategic formulation, you do indeed have to think creatively. Uh, and that, again, is a skill that can be hired for and developed. And then finally, flexibility. In many organizations, people who come with new ideas are actually ridiculed. They're, they're told that they're wishy-washy, uh, unable to commit, uh, and are not behind the program. Clearly, if you're continually forming your strategy, this attitude is not a very good one. So flexible people and flexible organizations are the ones who succeed with this. And actually, there's a very common pattern of strategic failure when it comes to flexibility, which is this one. Um, we call this the rolling stones pattern of failure. What that is, is that people get what they want, but they don't necessarily get what they need. So in this pattern of failure, the intended strategy and parts of the intended strategy that utterly failed contact with reality are allowed to live on in the deliberate strategy. Good ideas that emerge over the year as things change, as time passes, are blocked from entering to, into the stream. So your realized strategy is exactly what you hope to get, but let you, yet you're left thinking this is not quite right, this is not quite magical, and actually there are no changes to your business. Your KPIs don't change, you don't win anything. So this is the Rolling Stones pattern uh, of failure. The two key things are that you need proper structures, 
and you need the accompanying mindsets. You can't have one without the other. This brings us then neatly on to the mechanics. What are the things we can do, uh, the managerial tricks, the workshops, in order to bring continuous strategic formulation to life? The three parts of this are the execution cadence. This is what happens within an execution term. The second part, around learning cycles and our planning workshop, these are what happen in the breaks. So the cadence is pretty simple. We saw at the beginning of the talk that the year is broke into t broken up into terms and breaks. The term itself has um, four key meetings. The public meeting uh, is basically when we say what we're going to do. At Container Solutions, that is a whole company meeting. And we're a professional services firm, which means this meeting costs us a lot of money. But since we think alignment is a competitive advantage, it's a price that we're happy to pay. This is where we make bets in public, where I, as the CEO of our company, say this is what we're doing. This is, this is how we're going to win in the next three months, or if it's the long term, the next three and a half months. And my other managers do it as well, and the head of sales does it, and the head of marketing does it as well. The celebration meeting, that's what happens at the end of the term. So this is about pressure release. It begins the learning cycle, but it's not the end of the learning cycle. Uh, for us, this will come to an end, I think, on the 29th of July, which is a Friday. It's about celebration. We're going to the Efteling, by the way. Did, any Dutch people in here? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> So we're going to the Efteling as part of our celebration meetings, decompression. And then the meetings in between, the town hall meeting is a whole company meeting. And of course, we have weekly meetings where we're checking constantly, are we on track for this term? Are we on track for this month? What's going right? What's going wrong? That's it. It's a simple meeting rhythm. If you don't use this meeting rhythm for strategic execution, that's fine. But you have to use a meeting rhythm. If you think an email at the end of every month is enough to align your group and bring your strategies to life, well, I think you're dreaming. If anybody out there has email as a strategic tool and it's working for them, please let me know because I would like to, uh, I'd like to speak to you in more details about that. <laughs> but why? Why this cadence, right? What does it bring? Well, obviously, very clearly, the first one is alignment. Right? There is nothing mystical about alignment. It's a skill that all managers and leaders develop. It's about scanning your environment, understanding the goals you're trying to achieve, and finding the resources to achieve them. It's a constant thing. It's a habit you need to form. We hire for alignment at Container Solutions. We train for it. We teach our customers how to do it. The skill needs to be expressed somehow. And it's the cadence model and the meeting model that lets people express their alignment skills. The second thing, clearly accountability. Uh, there was a study done in America, I think a pretty common sense study, but basically it went something like this. They broke up a group of people into four or five groups. The first group set some goals. That was it. Most of those failed in accomplishing the goals. The second group set their goals and shared with a friend. The third group set goals, shared with a friend, and gave sporadic updates. And the fourth group set goals, shared with a friend, and gave a regular update on Friday via email. It was that group who succeeded in achieving nearly all of their goals. So accountability is really about asking questions, making bets in public, and providing the chance for those accountability conversations the quarterly, monthly, and weekly meetings. Often I WhatsApp people to say to them, can I speak to you tonight? It's probably because I want to talk about Game of Thrones or something. Um, and then they WhatsApp me straight back and say, oh, I've done the paperwork and I've spoke to that guy and I've fixed that. And that's because people at Container Solutions are used to being asked questions about their progress. So just a simple WhatsApp is enough to find out or get feedback on where particular work streams are. Problem solving. Of course, a big part of the meeting's cadence is about problem solving. Uh, in 1983, a guy called Donald Schoen, I think I pronounced that right, I think he's German, S-C-H-O-N, Schoen, um, he wrote a book and he talked a lot about 
reflection in action. Right? This is the thing that professionals do, we're all professionals, to solve problems in real time. So imagine a group of doctors and nurses trying to help somebody in accident and emergency. They don't get out a manual. They certainly don't call a planning meeting or host a retrospective when somebody's dying on the floor. So instead, they draw on a series of best, practice, best practices, instincts, and heuristics, and they go very quickly. A lot of that knowledge is unexpressible, it's tacit, but it works. So the cadence model gives us a chance to solve problems in real time. In other words, the cadence models gives us a chance to move very, very quickly. That's reflection in action. That's what happens in the term. Now, what happens outside the term? This is probably the most interesting part. The four things that really matter are organisational telepathy, deep learning, not superficial learning, but deep learning, dealing with strategic overcommitment, which is a serious issue in all strategic execution, and then finally, planning and execution. And the planning is about looking back at what just happened so we can figure out what we have to do next. So, telepathy. Hey. They're not in the right order. My apologies. Learning. Um, all learning cycles have got uh, three stages. The first stage, uh, basically, is about goals, goal setting. This is how adults learn, right? So if you write goals on a bit of paper every Monday or at the beginning of every month and then reflect on your goals at the end of the month or the end of the week, you will take over most of your colleagues who don't do this in about six to seven months because you will be rapidly accelerating your own learning. So before we do anything, we set goals. These are basically hypotheses. What do I think is going to happen if I do X, Y, and Z? Once we've set the goals, we start to do. That's what happens in our execution term. And hence the expression, we learn by doing. And of course, you do learn by doing, so it's important. And it's also important because by doing stuff, you try to work out if your ideas you know, match reality or not. And then finally, after a period of uh, activity, there's always a process of reflection. So you, think, you can think of the first stage as, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, what did you do? And so what? What does it mean? What do you make of this, this, these activities? What did you learn? Uh, it's basically a moment of analysis. If you don't have the breaks, you don't do any reflection. So if you don't do the reflection, then you will never tap in to this deeper type of learning. If you go from executing your strategy right up till Friday and then begin on the Monday straight away, you're not going to leave any time to think. So you will, be, you will get progressively less effective, which is cool if all your competitors are progressively getting less effective. But if any, any of them have built in a learning cycle to what they do, then in about six to 12 months, you're going to be in serious trouble. OK, so that brings me to objectives and key results. How many people who do OKRs have a break between when they finish and when they start? You? You have a break? So I've been sort of doing, in the, basically in the pub last night, I was, <laughs> I was speaking to... <laughs> I was sort of, I've been talking to people who are executing objectives and key results. Now, this came from uh, Andy Grove from Intel. I've read most of his books. I've been a student of his stuff for a very long time. Uh, and objectives and key results are designed to create focus and organizational learning. What, ha what tends to happen is people's OKR cycles end on the Friday, and then they start immediately on the Monday. So two things happen. Either two or three weeks before the cycle has ended, people start to plan. So forgetting the problems of multitasking, people start to lose focus. In an organisation like ours, and also when you're migrating to the cloud, where you've got these aggressive deadlines and these aggressive goals, it's not a very good idea in the, very, in the last few weeks to slow down and start to plan for the next cycle. So that's one thing that happens. The other thing that happens if people work till the last minute and then they start to plan the next execution cycle when, once it's already started. So they spend the next uh, 5, 10, 15 working days planning that cycle. Clearly, 
apart from that being exhausting and creating bad plans, there's no moment to reflect about what just happened and then change your plans for the following cycle or update your mental models. Why would a company do this? Apart from the fact that it's inhumane, uh, completely ineffective and boring, actually, why would you do this? Well, this is one of the key reasons, in my opinion. Um, in 2004, Westrum released his taxonomy of organisations. If you work in a pathological one, please apply for a new job immediately, because that's not a fun place to work. Um, most of us work in bureaucracies or in generative organisations. Generative organisation is a learning organisation. In bureaucracies, uh, bureaucracies are optimised for best practice. Remember that best practice is yesterday's practice, by definition. Um, and what they're trying to do is reduce the costs and create a system of fairness. So if you go to the Gemeente in Amsterdam, the, the city council, you will be treated the same despite your race, your age, your ethnicity, right? It's a fair system. Society doesn't function without bureaucracies. But failure is treated with justice and novelty is treated as a problem. What are we doing in the reflective break? We're seeking out novelty. We're trying to find new things to base our next series of plans upon. So the problem is when a bureaucracy comes to us and says, hey, we want to use containerized microservices, what they're actually saying is, we want to become a generative organization and not a bureaucratic one. The problem stated, uh, the, the first problem, we want to use microservices, sounds easy. The second problem, we want to become a generative organization, sounds very difficult. So there's nothing wrong with objectives and key results. But if you try to use them in a bureaucratical setting, it's very likely they will go the same way as the agile software methods, and that's to say they'll become a tool of accounting. Uh, they're very likely to fail. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to work out how many people are using objectives and key results that have actually changed their business. Because they're supposed to change your business. They're supposed to help you win battles you previously couldn't win. So if your profit's the same using OKRs, or if your innovation's the same, if you're not having any new ideas, I would say that they had hardly any effect. So there's nothing wrong with objectives and key results. They're awesome, but you've really got to read the manual. Um, this is the reason why. Strategic execution is the last thing you layer to a strong culture that has developed norms and processes. You cannot create a strong culture with an execution model. So if you're working in a difficult environment and you want to move to the cloud and you think objectives and key results are going to help, it would be wiser to spend your time developing the culture. If your business is more than three years old and you're not the founder, you're going to struggle to change the culture. Not impossible. There's a few companies right here, actually, that have tried it and are doing it, but it'll be difficult. You will get more victories improving your culture than trying to bring in a new planning or strategic execution method. That brings us to the next problem. So learning is a big problem that Hermes, our uh, toolkit, tries to solve. Another big problem is strategic overcommitment. So in a stable environment, it's actually quite easy to plan for the next one, two, three years. If you know what the dem demographic is doing, if you know what the economy is doing, whether you're in an upswing, a downswing, uh, a deleveraging, you can tap into that and then you could probably build a business upon it. In a really dynamic environment that is changing all the time, making plans in January uh, that may or may not make sense in October is a very hard thing to do. Lots of companies try this and then they fail. And what they then do is abandon strategic thinking altogether because they say that doesn't work for us and we're too fast moving. Now this is a mistake. The solution of course is to find a strategic model that lets you reformulate on the fly. Adapting to the environment or winging it is not a strategy. Uh, well, it is a strategy. I don't know if it's a very effective one. Bearing in mind that strategy is meant to help you use your resources wisely. Uh, a good example of strategic overcommitment can, uh, comes from history. So this is the uh, Maginot Line in France. I don't know if there's any 
students of history uh, in the room or if anybody recognises this. Um, but the Maginot Line was built after the First World War and it was built along the border with Italy, parts of Switzerland and Germany and it was a series of defences that were meant to stop trench warfare. Strategic overcommitment often comes when a company or team has a never again moment. When Adrian Cockcroft talks about organisational scar tissue, what he's talking about is processes that were laid down to make sure that something never happened again, but then atrophied and slowed you down. So this was France's never again moment. Unfortunately, by the time the Second World War came around, the context had changed, technology had moved on, uh, and the Germans had developed the Luftwaffe, so they simply flew over the wall, and the fast-moving tanks went around it. This is strategic overcommitment. Telepathy. This is my favourite bit of this talk. Um, organisational telepathy. Many teams seem to be telepathic. Um, they can read each other's minds, they can step into each other's shoes, uh, and they move very, very quickly, almost like they were thinking as one. However, it's an illusion. Organisational telepathy is an illusion. This learning cycle is from a guy called David Kolb. So it looks like the other one. There's three stages in it of goal setting, what Kolb calls active experimentation, the design of experiments. It's basically goal setting. The concrete experience is the do phase, it's the execute, and the reflective observations is the same as before. The difference is in Kolb's model is he introduces this concept of abstract conceptualization. And what he means by that is finding abstractions. You probably all saw Sam Newman's talk today, abstractions all the way up. It's about finding abstractions, frameworks, and a language to talk about what just happened. Um, I remember a few years ago when we started Container Solutions, we're in the middle of negotiating some tricky contracts. I was doing some, my, my co-founder Pinny was doing some others. We both were experimenting with this, we were both learning as we went along, and then we had a moment of reflection. But what we did next was go on a negotiation course which gave us the mental model and the framework for us to communicate about our experiences. And of course, this made it, so, this made it possible for all the future negotiations to go a lot smoother. So far, we've been talking about abstract things, but this Friday at Container Solutions, six of our colleagues are following the Container Solutions development program. This is an internal program that everybody goes on, lasts about nine months. The six sort of cornerstones that we'll try to develop, one of them strategic thinking. One of the reasons we do this is to give our colleagues this abstract uh, conceptual framework of how we work and why we work. And it's these shared mental models, these reciprocal mental models that let us go fast. Well, and WhatsApp helps. Um, so good communication tools and these reciprocal mental models are what create this organisational telepathy. So this then brings us to the sort of uh, crescendo of this talk, the planning method. Um, we have a very regimented planning method at Container Solutions. What we're trying to do in the preparation phase, this is done privately, this is not in a workshop or a meeting setting, is we're thinking about the results. Data, we need data. What happened? What happened there? What happened then? What happened here? Is there any correlation? But data is the easiest thing to find in a business. It's not always the richest source of information. You also have your feelings, your instincts, your reflections. This is also a type of preparation. Within the meeting itself, which can last between one and two days, we're trying to take the opinions of a group of people to build the current reality, what is happening. And we're not trying to share the five different viewpoints we have, the five or six viewpoints we have. We're trying to connect them to find one or two key learnings that the individuals couldn't have come across on their own. We're also trying to avoid recency bias, right? Because what happened last week is very likely to dictate how you're feeling and what you're thinking today. Of course, if you're thinking about reformulation, you have to ask yourself, does the vision and strategy for this year still make any sense? Um, because if it doesn't make sense, you need to take a radical uh, turn. If it does make sense, then you might think of incremental improvements. Together, these produce the objectives and key results 
for the next execution cycle. That is where most execution methods and tools stop. The thing we do differently at Container Solutions is we put a lot of time into thinking how should we order these objectives? What should come first? And if this is more valuable, uh, how can we leverage that with the second and third set of objectives? This is a highly creative activity. It's a skill we're trying to develop. And in fact, I think we've done quite well at it. And it's what we call stratagem configuration. We're trying to configure these pieces of the strategy. And of course, they feed in to the execution cycle. And then together, you can see the model behind me looks something like that. Conclusion. We are always trying to go as fast as possible without breaking everything. Um, well, preferably without breaking anything. We believe in going fast because when you execute fast, you learn fast. We also work in a radically competitive landscape. And on top of that, we work in a landscape that is changing constantly. The best practices of a few months ago are probably different now. The tool sets of today are different now. I don't know if anybody saw Jason's talk earlier about Istio. There's three different APIs and they're changing constantly. How can you adapt to this changing tool set whilst getting value from it? That's what we do with our strategic execution method. So we're trying to balance focus and learning. We're definitely trying to develop organizational telepathy. Um, and of course, by dropping bits of the strategy that, not, that are not working, we're trying to increase our speed. However, you need to balance the speed and the practices that let you go fast with a cadence model that supports alignment, accountability, and problem solving. However, if you move into the cloud or you want to adopt continuous formulation, you need to change your hiring practices and you also need to implement training that supports this. This is not an easy thing to do. It's not easy to go from being an unaccountable firm to an accountable firm. That's what we're trying to do with our methods and our tool set. And uh, I sincerely hope that you all took something from this. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. That was awesome. I love, I love watching him talk because every time I'm like, oh, that's something I can do in my everyday life, or at least hope to push, push upwards. Some questions came through. Please feel free to add more in, in the app as well. So the first one would be, how do you fit engineering projects around strategic cadence, like a long-term project that maybe spans more than those three terms? Mm, that's a good question. Um, so are we talking about projects that are separate to the business strategy? I don't know who asked that question. Oh yeah, okay. So I would, I would say that, um, so there's the, there's the business cadence, there's what we're trying to do as a business, and then there's the, the migration. In my opinion, before you start your project, you need to sit down and think, okay, what is the cadence for this project? Uh, what is it that we want to achieve? And oh, is it a stable project? Is it a, is it a Java uh, platform that you're building based on old requirements? In which case, the learning cycle could probably be shorter. Or is it something radically new involving uh, machine learning and a customer that's weird and a set of requirements that are changing? So you need to design your own cadence and take these tools and cobble them together that, you know, so they make the most sense with your project. At Container Solutions, we are, of course, running lots of technical projects, and the lead engineers on those projects need to be aware of the wider cadence. Uh, to give you an example about that, we're probably going to be speaking at Go to Copenhagen in November, and it's good if the teams developing the software know about that because they might want to bring some of their customers along to showcase their work at that conference. So you need situational awareness between the projects and the, the top of the business. That question worries me because I thought we had confirmed you for Go to Copenhagen. <laughs> but I guess we have to talk afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> can you clarify a bit what you meant by change hiring practices? Yeah, I can, I can, I can indeed clarify that. Um, so many teams um, who, right, leadership, leadership comes in two forms. So when a change happens, we think of the leadership response as alignment, right? So we're going to move to the cloud. 
a leader, typical leadership behaviour is talking to people, getting in their ear, socialising and putting all the ducks in one row. If you're in a senior part of a company, you might talk to the shareholders and try to align the board. But the management response is to hire, to build capability. If you're going to do something new, it's almost 100% guaranteed that the people you've got in your organisation are not going to be the people who can carry out this next project. And by def well, not by definition, but by extension, the people you've got probably don't have the right skills around uh, problem solving, flexibility, and good judgment. So you've got to do two things. You've got to develop those skills internally, and you've got to hire for them. So you've got to change your hiring interviews to match these characteristics that you need for this program. So a concrete example would be a number of the companies we help move to the cloud, we actually help them to rewrite their job specifications, change the hiring procedure, and at conferences like this, come and engage with engineers using different language and ex you know, expressing their different strategic aims. I hope that answers the question. I, was, I went around the trees a bit. Yeah. <laughs> and, and feel free to follow up in the app because I can follow up on that. Um, have you ever used continuous formulation in the medical domain? And maybe are there any particular constraints? I have never used... <laughs> no, no, I'm not even allowed near our laptops at work. They would not let me around um, <laughs> patients. Uh, I don't know anything about the um, uh, learning within, within the medical industries. But what they do in medicine is something called m and conferences, uh, morbidity and mortality conferences. And it's going to sound gruesome, but basically healthcare professionals come together to discuss how they accidentally killed people. Um, this is classic reflection on action. And as much as we wouldn't want to talk about that, if you don't talk about how you mistakenly kill people, you're very likely to keep making the same mistakes again. So medicine is a good example. There's a lot of studies around continuous formulation in medicine, especially around reflection uh, in action, going quick, and reflection on action with conferences where we learn to sort of, uh, what's the word, extend our best practices based on new information. All right, so the next one is a few questions that I'm gonna to combine together, but it's gonna be a, kind of a two-parter. Yeah. So the first part is a bit on how do you manage your portfolio of customer projects so that you have that time to focus and, and deal with the, your own strategy? Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of cadence or method you have around that? Mm -hmm. And then furthermore, can you talk a little bit about how you've been like iterating on your execution framework? I, <laughs> fuck yes, that I can do. Uh, so the first part, how do we manage the portfolio of customers? Uh, this comes back to our own strategy. So if your company can do six or seven things, you should probably do about three or four, right? Because you want to do them well and you want to continually learn. So for all of this theory and nonsense about Greek and Roman gods, the truth is the secret to strategic execution is doing less than you can actually do. Right? So don't overcommit, don't be greedy. Um, part of that for us is setting our standards high. We try to uh, have a good value exchange so we're not always skating with bankruptcy. When you don't have any cash, all of this costs money. If you don't have any cash, you lose the freedom to move and then you start to compromise. And you focus on uh, revenue generation at the cost of developing your own strategy. If you're a small business like ours, you need strong financial controls to make sure you've got cash in the bank to play with. If you're a large company like some of the people who visit in this conference, you need clear budgeting so you know when you're on track and when you're off track. And we would lump that in the category of fin financial alignment. Now, as to the question of how did we iterate on this, it's a good question. A very important rule of thumb is to right-size your strategic execution method to your company. So this used to happen for the, in the first year of our existence in my head. So I, I would write down what I want to achieve and what I don't want to achieve. And then, as it extended, I started to coach and think, well, actually, once, once there was, you know, it was Pinny and me, and then there was another two managers, so we were like, oh, I reckon we should have a weekly meeting. Sounds like a good idea. Um, this is not a bad thing. We were not unprofessional, but the method matched match the size of our company. And so the, the trick is to keep pruning it and extending it, and in the breaks, to not only question your strategy, but does this execution method still make sense? 
The, the strategic workshops at the end of the terms are very new. That's only come in in the last six months as we've grown uh, to be an international business and as the problems we're dealing with have grown more complex. Cool. Um, so we have time for just maybe one more. I'm trying to combine a few together. How about, um, do you have a favorite real world experience from applying this kind of um, methodology or framework? Yeah, container solutions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I've been trying to teach this and preach this since I was 20. I'm now 42. I know I look about 48. It's working with this lot. Um, container solutions started with a very, very small amount of funding three years ago. It's now in five countries and is, you know, a very nice, friendly company, well recognized within the world of cloud native. And Pinny and I were very lucky that we had a chance to express our our skills and express our ideas and we found a team and a management team to support us in doing that. And then of course there's all of our customers but I can't talk about them on camera who use all of these methods to succeed with their own programs. Cool. Can we do one more round of applause? Thank you so much.